Good evening, everybody. So you may have seen my community post, but we had some deliveries recently. And this is one of them. The Midnight Solar Power Flow 16, 16 kilowatt hour battery. So let's take a look at it. It actually showed up right in the middle of a grid outage. And during that grid outage, we had very little solar. So having a 16 kilowatt hour battery show up right in the middle of that was awesome. So I ended up pulling it out of the box right away and charged it up using the generator and a charge verter to get this thing up to 100%. And then I went through and introduced it into my system so that we could utilize that extra 16 kilowatt hours of storage. So fast forward, grid's back on, had a great sunny day today, so the batteries were able to recharge a bit on their own. So I removed this from the system so we could open it up and take a look at it. Let's take a look at some of the specs first, then I'll show you the unboxing that I did during the outage, and Let's run a capacity test on this thing and see how it does. So this is a 16 kilowatt hour battery, lithium iron phosphate with a 51.2 volt nominal voltage. They use EVE or REPT A plus lithium iron phosphate, 314 amp hour cells. Cycle life is up to 8,000 cycles at 77 degrees Fahrenheit. Nominal charge and discharge current is 160 amps but the maximum discharge is 210 amps. Communications got CAN, RS-45, and RS-232. They have a customized battery management system, which allows them to seamlessly integrate with the Midnight One inverter, which means you don't have to worry about dip switches, programming, addressing, none of that stuff. You plug into this battery, you plug into the inverter, and it takes care of it on its own. That seamless integration also allows for firmware updates through the inverter. So any inverter that has the ability to communicate with the pylon protocol can communicate with this battery. This has an, a built-in active balancer with four amps balancing current. It's expandable up to 16 units in parallel with a capacity up to 257 kilowatt hours. This is an outdoor rated battery with an IP65 rating. Compliance listings, there's a UL1793, UL9540A, and UL9540. So the PowerFlow 16 also has a 20 year design life and the longest in industry 15 year warranty. Dimensions on this battery, width 19 and three quarters, height including the feet, 32 inches depth, including the brackets on the back. We're looking at about 10 and a quarter inches. And this thing is a monster weighing in at 284 pounds. And I felt every pound of it as I was moving it. We've got a wall sticker for a template to be able to mount this thing to the wall, which is a very nice touch because the mounting brackets are separate. And so having to space everything out would be a pain, but since we've got the template, it should be easy to stack on the wall. If that's what you're planning on doing, pretty thick steel brackets, inspection report. We've got mounting anchors for the brackets, two different types of cables. One looks to be a straight pass through. And then this one says battery. Oh, battery and inverter CAN bus cable. And it even gives you the pins on the sides, that's a nice touch. It comes with two battery lugs and then extra cat communication terminals if you need to make a custom cable. And then we pop the thick insulation out to reveal the beast. Look at that. Now we gotta get it out. <laughs> I think the only way that you're gonna pop this thing out is I'm running out of room here. Whoo! I 
Yep. She's a heavy one. Yikes. So on the front of the inverter, it's this nice white with the Midnight Solar logo on the side. We have our battery indicator with a run, alarm, and then a state of charge indicator. On the left-hand side, we've got a knockout. I believe the production models are gonna have a two inch knockout on both sides. We've got our spec listing here, danger sticker, and then you've got handles down here and then a built-in handle right here as well. On the back side, we've got our slots for our mounting brackets on the top and on the bottom. And then there is a venting port here on the back. On the right hand side of the inverter, we have our knockout again over here. We do have a 125 amp Nader breaker in this IP67 cover with a built-in shunt trip. So the BMS can shut down the battery and then two handles on this side as well. <laughs> you see, I got stuff all scratched up already on the top from moving things around from out. I had the charge verter sitting on top and it was sliding all over the place. But if we pop the top, we can look underneath. We've got our positive and negative terminals, which hold an M8 bolt. We've got two RS45 ports for link in and link out for daisy chaining batteries together. And then we've got our CAN communication port going back to the inverter. And then terminal covers for the positive and negative. And then a grounding stud for the battery. So we've got five screws on each side, four screws on the top, four screws on the bottom. Now let's see what's inside. Gotta disconnect. There, got the cables removed from the display. Got a plastic shroud over everything, which is kind of nice. And a waterproof gasket all the way around the outside edge. Little plastic screws holding down this shroud. I like the shroud because it's a good isolation between the cells in the lid. Would hate for that to come in contact if some something got pushed or pressed. It's a nice barrier. All right, what's underneath? Open it up and you get that. Uh, <laughs> it's almost like the the new car smell, but it's you know adhesive smell. Let's get a closer look at this, shall we? Very nice. All right, so we've got laser welded bus bars with expansion bends in the bus bars just to help if there is any expansion with the cells. I see several temperature sensors spaced out. There's T1. We got T4. So they're right on top of the bus bars. T3. It looks like the sensors and the balance leads are welded down and then they put glue on top of it to make sure that it doesn't go anywhere. So we've got our different balance leads. It's all bundled up nice and neat along this rail and they're zip tied down. From this view, everything looks good. I see they have epoxy boards around the outside to isolate the cells from the metal dividers and the metal container. And they've got I can't tell if it's fish paper or a black epoxy board, but they've got it between each cell, which is good. Oh, under the epoxy board, I see a heating pad on the outside edge going. It's, I know it's hard to see. Can you see those coils from the heating pad down there? So they've got a heating pad here and then one along the outside of here. 
one here and one along this side as well. When the heaters turn on, they're going to heat from the outside in, which is good. So this line right here is for the fire arrest system. So that's going to come around and go down to this yellow box right here. Double negative and double positive cables looks like 25 millimeters squared cable. So the model on the BMS says LV1002LFP. This is the first BMS that I've seen that actually has a CT on some of its battery connections, which is different. But a CT on the positive cable. Positive comes over into our breaker. And then from there, it goes down to our battery terminal right here. So the black spiral wrap are the balance leads and the temperature sensors, and then the white leads go for the active balancer. Now it does look like the active balancer leads are soldered onto the nickel that's welded onto the bus bars. I'm usually not a fan of the soldered connection. It can hold, but that's just me. So all the balance leads are labeled over here, just like they're labeled on the opposite ends, which is nice to see. That is that a preach precharge resistors built onto the board? I think so. This one says five watt eight ohm. So the only thing that I see that's not bundled up is the these two red leads, the two tiny red leads. They look like they come over to the switch. Kind of look just thrown into the bottom and not bundled up together. Oh, you know what they are? Those are for the heaters. Okay, so these two red leads right here they go over to the heater on this side, right back there, but between, there's two red leads going right over here. And then the camera doesn't want to focus very well, but there's two red leads right here and two red leads right down in there. They could be wire managed a little bit better down there, but everything else is nice and zip tied together. So just the, the battery heaters, and then they all come and terminate into that same port, that red one right down there. So yeah, that's not, that's not the switch. The switch is actually in this black wrapped line right here. There's actually quite a bit of cable for that display on the front of the battery. It's just most of it's tucked in under here. So I, I was thinking that it was, you know, super short, like that much room, but no, there's, there's a lot there. So you don't have to be as cautious as I was if you have to pop this top, which again, you shouldn't pop the top. I'm doing this just to show you what's inside. So all in all, a very well-built battery. So I removed the screws. Let's see if I can get a picture of one of these barcodes very carefully. Go to the global power decoder, paste, decode. There we go. Code seems right. So Eve power cells, 314 amp hours. Production date, April 23rd, 2024. Let's try one more. Copy that one. Delete, paste, decode. 
There we go, Eve Power. April 23rd, 2024. Very cool. I got things screwed back down. It's all nice and snug again. So I think we're to the point now that we need to charge this puppy up so we can do a capacity test and see, do these brand new Eve cells pull 314 amp hours? So the battery got all charged up last night and now we are ready for doing 100% capacity discharge test. So I took the PowerFlow 16, I have it wired into my bus bar system. I actually disconnected the one inverter from the house so the one can do all the testing for this battery. I switched this over to lead acid mode so it can discharge and basically let the BMS decide when everything is gonna shut down. So it's gonna discharge as much as possible. We have a full battery right now. We're going to use my charge verter as the dump load to take power from this to dump it into the main house system. And then I have my smart shunt right here set that will be used for our measurements. So if you can see it, this switch right here is the normal switch which connects this inverter to the main battery bank. This is in the off position right now. So this battery will be the only thing that powers this inverter. I believe I saw when we looked inside the battery, there should be a pre-charge resistor. So we're gonna follow this kind of the standard pre-charge steps that I've seen with other batteries because this is my first battery that I am aware of that has a pre-charge resistor in it. So with a pre-charge resistor when it's built into the battery we need to turn on the breaker first and then when you press the button to turn the BMS on with the battery it does its own little pre-charge steps to prevent inrush. And so the easiest way that I can think of to see what happens is to put a clamp meter on it. So let's turn this on and see what, if the inverter powers on. 0.3 of an amp. 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7. So yeah. Looks like it worked fine, and the inverter's all powered on. It's in standby mode right now, but it's all powered on. AC input is turned off, and then I removed battery communications, and there's our charge verter going into our main battery bank. Yeah, so it really helps if you're gonna use a shunt to test your system, to have your negative go through the shunt. <laughs> so, we got that all straightened out. Everything's powered back on, inverter is on. We can look at the smart shunt settings here and we're pulling 90 watts right now out of the inverter. And then I've got five watts-ish running for a Raspberry Pi too, so 80 to 85 watts for the inverter. Then we've got a 30 amp double pull right here coming off of the inverter, going to our charge verter. We do need to calculate what a 0.2C, a 20% discharge rate is. So 314 amp hours times 0.2, 62.8 amps. So we'll probably try to program in around that 62 amp rate for discharging out of the battery. So let's flip the breaker to turn the charge verter on. This is the V1 charge verter. So we'll take this up to 62 amps. It's actually, it was 62.8, wasn't it? We'll just 62.8 and turn on the breaker. And if we look at the smart shunt data, we're pulling 69.75 amps out of the battery. So we'll come back over here Take this down to 61. There we go. 68.05 amps, that's pretty close. So we'll let that discharge run through the rest of the night and tomorrow we will see what the results are of the discharge test on the 
Midnight Solar Power Flow 16 battery. Here's a freebie. The inverter can run batteryless. As soon as PV started coming in, the inverter fired back up, even though the battery's all disconnected. Not sh quite sure why it's saying that grid is turned on when everything is turned off. But, yes, this can run batteryless. All right, so we need to reapply power to this DC system so that our smart shunt can tell us how much power was discharged. So I'm actually gonna turn off the battery so it doesn't try and start charging right now. I turned on my power supply right there, right there, to supply power into the system to turn the shunt back on. And here we go. Low state of charge. I forgot to clear all this information, but if we look at this top right hand section where it says last discharge, we got 314 amp hours of discharge. Yeah. So out of a 314 amp hour battery, we got the full 314 amp hours, which is awesome. So this thing charged to 50, 55%. And so I wired it into the main system. I figure that should be enough that it can blend properly. Looks like the other system is 82% because we basically just took power from this to put it into here to kind of, you know, level it out. So, what's Andy like to say? Without further to do, <laughs> uh, let's turn it on and see how much power flows between. Got 51 amps, 49 amps flowing out. Excuse me, flowing in. So it'll go from the main battery bank into this. And then tomorrow is supposed to be a perfectly sunny day. So it should bring everything up to 100% so it can balance nicely. And it's dropping down to 30 amps now. So it won't be too long and it'll level right out. So one of the big features about this battery when you use it with the midnight inverter is the fact that you don't have to really configure anything to get it to communicate with the inverter other than saying that it's a midnight battery. You don't have to set any dip switches, none of that stuff. So we're going to see if that works. I've got a straight pass through cable right here, which is going to run over to the midnight inverter. We'll feed it right through the knockout and plug it right into this center can port. And coming over to the inverter, here's our can cable that we'll just plug right into the can port down here. So we're gonna jump over to the Midnight app, scroll down to the settings area and go to stored energy and enter into the battery section. And we need to change the battery brand selection. Right now it's on a lithium battery, no BMS, which I believe means you know no BMS communication. We wanna to switch to the midnight battery, hit okay. And as soon as we did that, now we can see right here, there's a BMS tag. And then the state of charge changed as well. And now we have communication between the inverter and the battery back in the app real fast. We're going to come back to this home screen and swipe from the right to the left. And if we look at the battery section, we can see that it says midnight battery, battery capacity, 314 amp hours. So there's two more things that I want to test just before we wrap things up. The first one is going to be since the BMS in this battery is based on the pylon protocol. Any inverter that can utilize that pylon protocol should be able to communicate with this battery and pull its information and let the BMS control the charge and discharge states. So I want to try that with the Victron system. So we're going to pop the top off. I've already gone into the midnight inverter and set it to a lithium no BMS mode so that it stops trying to get communication from the battery. And we'll disconnect this CAN communication cable from the midnight inverter. 
Over here on my Serbo, I already have in line a VE BMS cable that I made for prior build. And that is plugged in right over here to the BMS CAN port. And it's a custom pinout on the Victron side. So you need to make sure that you have the proper pinout on the Victron side because it's not the same as what the standard CAN pinout is. On the opposite side, I've got, it doesn't really want to focus, but it's a pin out for CAN using pins four and five, and I believe it has pin seven as a ground as well. As soon as I plug in this cable into the CAN port, which is connected to my servo, this battery should show up in my device list on my servo display. So let's plug this in. And right there on the device list, we can see BMS CAN, and we can step into it. Currently it's got 86% battery, pulling 4.2 amps out of it. We can look at the details, see our lowest and highest cell voltages, and our installed capacity. So yeah, no problems, nice and simple. Just plug it in. So the very last test that I want to run on this battery is it can handle up to a maximum output of 210 amps. And so I thought, well, why not turn off all the other batteries and let this run the house? Let's just see how high it goes. I know my wife is getting ready to do dishes, so that means that the well is going to be cycling, the water heater is going to be cycling. So, yeah, let's crank it up, huh? And hopefully at, oh, 9 o'clock at night, the lights don't go out. <laughs> but we can have some fun with it. So let's turn off that one and that one, that one, that one, and that one. So now if we look at the Lynx shunt, we're outputting 14.5 amps and our clamp meter says 14.3 amps. So every, every other battery is out. So let's go turn on the well and the water heater and See how it does. <laughs> like it, it, it should be able to handle 160 amps, no problem. With a maximum up to 210. So at 108 amps, I accidentally started my camera in time-lapse mode and didn't realize it. 5,600 watts. I walk over to the inverter and just take a peek real fast, 2.4, Kilowatts on leg one, 2.6 on leg two. So with 108 amps, let's add the vacuum to leg one, just to add a little bit more. It will get noisy. Oh, there goes the well. 170 amps from the well on surge. Now we're down to 140, and no problems whatsoever. 3.1 on leg one, 3.3 on leg two. So what's this vacuum going to do? I don't know. Let's find out. 185. 4.2 on leg one, 3.3 on leg two. So we're at 168 right now, 8,600 watts. Let's do this. I know my Blue Eddy power station needs to charge from the grid outage that we had in the past. So we'll plug that into leg two. 2.5 on leg one, 3.8 on leg two. 139 amps being drawn from the battery right now. So let's turn that vacuum back on. So now we're at 183, 169, 166, no problem. 3.7 on leg one, 3.8 on leg two. No alarms, no problem. Battery really doesn't seem to care. 
So let me run and kick the sink on so that well kicks on again. All right, the well just kicked on, 175 amps, 3.2 on leg one, 4.6 on leg two, turn the vacuum cleaner, and everything just died. <laughs> Woo, it didn't like that, but I don't know what the number was. <laughs> I decided to go back and, and start rolling through the footage again, just to see if I could figure out exactly what happened. So I had thought that 175 amps caused it to trip. It wasn't. It was 175 amps when the well kicked in, and then I went and turned the vacuum cleaner on. So I just did a test to see what the surge on startup of the vacuum would be, and it was 37 and a half amps DC. So what's this vacuum going to do? I don't know. Let's find out. 185. So you add 175 plus 37 and a half. Now we're at 212 amps over the maximum output of this battery. And so that's what caused it to trip. So whew. <laughs> That makes me feel a whole lot better because yeah, I'm, I'm like, what's going on? This thing isn't working, but no, it, it, it did exactly what it's supposed to do. I went over that max discharge value and it went into safety mode like it's supposed to. So no problem whatsoever. So <laughs> with that note, uh, final thoughts on this battery. I mean, it's my first wall mount battery I'm a guy that kind of likes the details, so I kind of wish the display had a little more information than, than just a state of charge indicator, but that's, that's fine. If I can get that data through the app, then sure. At least at a glance, I can see what, what's going on with the battery. Because they use their own BMS, we're supposed to get a lot of information from the BMS in the app for the Midnight One Inverter. It's a 16 kilowatt hour battery. I mean, the other, the other big ones that I've seen, with the exception of one, are 15. So this is, you know, being able to use larger cells in really probably the same form factor. The build quality was very well. I love that they've got the heaters on the outside of the cells to heat from the outside in, which does remind me, I believe I read off of the spec sheet for the heaters that once the ambient temperature, once the temperature drops below 32 degrees, the heaters will automatically kick in and charging will only happen once the batteries are above 32 degrees. So any power that comes in would go straight to those heaters to warm up those cells. Uh, I like the fact that when you can connect this to the one inverter, it is a, gonna be a full-blown ESS system. I don't remember what the UL listing is, but, but it's probably the way that a lot of requirements are going to go so that your inverter has the ability to shut down the output from the battery for safety reasons. I mean, there's a lot that I could say. A lot of the features for this battery really could be looked at as a pro. I mean, IP65 rated, a 15 year warranty. That's crazy on a battery, a 20 year design life, but a 15 year warranty on a battery? I think the max that I've ever seen is 10 years. If I had to find some cons, probably, when we looked inside, the heater wires were not managed like they should have been. Now that could be because this is a pre-production model. They might be cleaned up in the production models. Personally, I would have liked to have seen the Amphenol connectors uh, in the top. I saw them on the, the pre-production 5K batteries and I was hoping that they would be here on this battery. I think that's more from my standpoint of 
I'm connecting and disconnecting things so frequently that, you know, not having to mess with grabbing a ratchet, just click, click. So, I mean, to some people, it might not be a con. Is it really a big one? No. I wish that they had more battery connections in here so that if you, when you put multiples of these next to each other or multiple batteries next to this, that you could just daisy chain off of this battery. But I will say that I was told they are working on a conduit box that sits on top and inside that conduit box, there's going to be a bus bar that you will connect from here to that bus bar and you can interconnect multiple batteries together on that bus bar and then go up to your battery. So I guess from that standpoint, when the conduit box is, is done and ready, it's really a moot point. So again, is it really a big issue? Probably not. I mean, all in all, we had a perfect capacity test. It was handling 175 amps, no problem, until I <laughs> added that extra load to kick it over the edge. But again, that was on me. So overall, it's a nice battery. We'll end up having some more tests, I can almost guarantee it. I start seeing this winter test keeps coming to mind. <laughs> I don't know how I could do it, but that's that's something that, that comes to mind is, you know, you got to test these little heaters and stuff. So I don't know. Do I mount it outside on the barn somehow? I don't know. We'll see. If you have ideas, let me know. But I do want to thank Midnight Solar for sending this to me to try it out, put it through its paces, see how it does. I'll apologize for this being a long video, but uh, we got to we gotta run it through a lot of different tests. I probably should have apologized at the beginning of the video before we even started. <laughs> so I'll apologize now, but uh, I'm going to let you go before I keep rambling on. So y'all stay safe, stay cool, and we'll catch up with you later.